Welcome back to the Gnome Show, everyone. I'm Josh, your humble host, and it is my duty today, my pleasure, to trawl the briny depths of YouTube so that I may bring you the shinies. I cover short films of varying genres, video games, analog horror, and sci-fi, and really anything else that I think is good. I hope you'll enjoy tonight's offering, content for the blood god. And now on with the show. Tonight, I have uh, the crazy story behind Michael Jackson's forgotten thriller sequel. So I, I okay, so I'm I'm an old fuck, and I remember seeing the original um, uh, thriller and the making of thriller uh, on uh, MTV way back in the day. Um, especially when Halloween rolled around. Um, thriller was a big thing. So, um, I would like to find out, uh, uh, about a possible, uh, well, there was supposed to be a sequel. That sounds pretty fucking interesting. So, um, we're gonna go check it out. Um, so, grab something to drink, something to smoke, something, uh, um, snack on. And, uh, let's boogie. in history playing five different parts in a musical horror film written by the king of one of the biggest artists in history playing five different parts in a musical horror film written by the king of horror directed by a special effects legend utilizing groundbreaking effects and was the longest music video ever for over 15 years it wait what do you mean you don't remember it okay hold on let's start a little earlier When his insanely popular album Thriller was displaced from the top of the Billboard 200 chart eight months after its release, Michael's manager suggested making a music video for the title track. And after seeing John Landis's film An American Werewolf in London, Michael asked him to direct it, which he only agreed to do if they could do it as a short film, an idea Michael supported. The problem was most music videos at this time cost between 20 and $50,000 to produce. For Thriller, they needed half a million, and although they struggled to secure the money initially, they raised the funds through a strategic finesse, selling the rights to a making of documentary to various television stations. A making of documentary that after the insane success of the video, popularized the format and has since sold over 10 million copies. Welcome to the making of Thriller. The rest is history. And Thriller became the first music video in history to be inducted the into the United States is, National is Film Registry by the Library of Congress of as culturally, historically, or aesthetically like, significant, uh, and is credited for legitimizing music videos as a serious um, art form, breaking racial barriers in the film howling, and on TV stations uh, like I MTV, saw, um, and certifying MJ the as the king well, of pop. The howling too. But, uh, the, king Dexter. the howling was great, but it was American Werewolf in London. <laughs> And part of the massive um, success of Thriller could really also be credited to a philosophy that Michael carried across projects from that album onwards, so, that he doesn't make music videos, but short films. I don't even allow people to say the word video. That's taboo around here. So, so we say it's a short film. According to him, that's how they approached all of his videos. I wanted the most talented people in the business, the best cinematographer, the best lighting people we could get. We weren't shooting on videotape. It was 35 millimeter film. We were serious. And the best people he got for sure. From recruiting iconic directing legends like Martin Scorsese, Spike Lee, David Fincher, and John Singleton. He would similarly fill the videos with entertainment legends from Eddie Murphy and Marlon Brando to Macaulay Culkin and Steven Spielberg, Chris Tucker, Wesley Snipes, and even the GOAT Michael Jordan. And so, at an unparalleled level of fame, Michael faced an intense media scrutiny that he hated. A scrutiny he fought with three simple words. Riding through an amusement park of newspaper clippings and tabloids reporting on his eccentric behavior and outright lies, and then blending and conflating the two, the stop motion style of the video leans into the media's distortion 
of Michael's personal life and public image by featuring wacky, surreal imagery and took nine months to produce. There are references to many tabloid rumors about Jackson at the time, such as one story that claimed he slept in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber to slow his aging, after an image of him lying down in one leaked to the media after he visited a hospital, or a reference to when Michael bought a chimpanzee named Bubbles, and tabloids that took that as a sign of Michael's increasing detachment from reality. A nose and a scalpel are an obvious reference to the obsession with his cosmetic surgeries, and one of the most important ones is the reference to a report that Jackson had offered to buy the bones of Joseph Merrick, a severely deformed man from 19th century England who was exhibited at a freak show under the stage name The Elephant Man. And in reference to buying his bones, Michael stated that that was a complete lie. Did you buy the Elephant Man's bones no, when you were trying to get them? that's another stupid story. Uh -huh. I love the story of the Elephant Man. It reminds me of me a lot. You know, I could relate to it. It made me cry because I saw myself in the story. But no, I never asked for the elephant. Where am I, <laughs> where am I gonna put some bones? I don't know. And why would I want a pair of bones? <laughs> I don't know. But so where did, where did that come from? Someone makes it up and everybody believes it. If you hear a lie often enough, you start to believe it. And in the video towards the end, to parody the rumors, Michael's seen dancing with an elephant man's bones. And this would have a lot more meaning later because exactly 10 years afterwards, in 1997, on the same album that Ghost was meant to promote, Blood on the Dance Floor, History in the Mix, Jackson features one of his darkest songs, Morphine, about his addiction to painkiller medication, and features a sample from the movie based on Merrick's life, David Lynch's The Elephant Man, drawing a very interesting comparison between them. Can you come with me, please? Elephant Man was a good movie. The sampled scene itself shows Merrick being hesitant to follow a new doctor's instructions, fearing exploitation and manipulation, given his past experiences being exhibited. Similarly, Michael feels like his life is being treated like a spectacle, like a circus, and shares Merrick's distrust. And these stories inspire the derogatory nickname, Wacko Jacko. I am not an animal. You should not say he's an animal. He's a, you should not say he's Jacko. I'm not a Jacko. I'm Jackson. How do you feel when they call you? Wacko yeah, Wacko Jacko. Where'd that come from? Some English tabloid. I have a heart and I have feelings. I feel that when you do that to me. It's not nice. Don't do it. I'm not a Wacko. To symbolize Jackson's frustration with the press treating him as an oddity, the video reveals that the entire amusement park is actually a giant Jackson himself, and he breaks free, tearing it to the ground in a very symbolic gesture. Then in 1993, Paramount Pictures brought Michael onto the film Adam's Family Values to record a horror-themed song for the film, and to make a tie-in short film to promote it, a project which was meant to become Is This Scary? a 12 to 15 minute long musical horror short film. Michael contacted the author Stephen King, popularly known as the King of Horror, to write the film from a story idea he had, and King agreed, finding that he was fascinated by the idea of writing a musical for the first time. You know, I was known as the horror guy, the master of horrors, and he said, I really want to do this video, and I want to do the scariest video that's ever been done, and you're just the person to do it. The film follows the story of a character known as the Maestro, a resident of an old mansion overlooking the suburban town of Normal Valley. Yeah, Normal, Normal Valley. Valley. I think you can see where this is going. The town's mayor despises the Maestro's scary but harmless magic tricks and organizes a group of townspeople and their children who like and defend the Maestro to force him out of the town for being strange. Wow, that's the... Um... What did you want? We want you out of town. You don't fit in here. You're not That's like us. That's the doctor. Why do I have to be? You're not like anybody. You're weird. So? These kids think you're scary. And, uh, scary. that's the... That's the dad from, uh, young Sheldon. Do you think I'm scary? You bet you're scary. You're a weirdo and we want you out of town. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. Yeah, it's the, I'm the, weirdo. the head doctor I don't from fit Strokes. in, and I don't... Well, he said people in this town felt that this person on the hill was weird and strange and scary 
and the kids were kind of like, yeah, we, we sort of dig this guy. <laughs> you know? What he wanted to say was, strange isn't bad, and people who think strange is bad are expressing a kind of herd mentality. He made a point to say they didn't like it, that the kids liked him. It was a way of him saying, look, I am what I am, and the kids like it, and so what? Interestingly, during the shoot of this scene, Michael wanted the mob to hurl actual insults at him. According to actor Troy Evans, Michael wanted the camera to capture a real visceral reaction, like we're witnessing the uncovering of a real psychological wound. And apparently no matter how much the actors tried, nothing worked. After every take, they would say, we want you to really, really go after him. We'd come around to take 57 or something, you know? And I said, you f and bleached freak, stay away from my son! And they said, cut. And then they came right over to me and said, no, no, really insult him. <laughs> you know, I had no idea where to go from there. Unfortunately, the response that finally made Michael snap is not known. But Michael's seething answer to a metaphorical manifestation of all the people who called him weird and strange through the lens of fiction is truly interesting to hear. Know what you can do for me? Kiss right here. Kiss right here. You are swine. You are a goddamn pig. Go to hell. Every last one of you, pig. Is this scary? Ah! Ah! Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that this narrative is very pointedly about Michael's life, and it gets much wilder. But while the production was underway, allegations of inappropriate conduct with a child were made against Michael, alongside contractual disputes leading to the production being cancelled. There have been many disgusting statements made recently concerning allegations of improper conduct on my part. These statements about me are totally false. Michael's public image went through irreparable damage. Now, while this is not a video about the allegations themselves, there are quite a few details that are important to ghosts and the narrative. One of the people who led the prosecution against Jackson, a Santa Barbara district attorney named Tom Snedden, remember that name, executed a search warrant allowing them to take nude photographs of Jackson to match against descriptions made by his accuser. The warrant further stated that I had no right to refuse the examination or photographs and if I failed to cooperate with them, they would introduce that refusal at any trial as an indication of my guilt. It was the most humiliating ordeal of my life. In an out-of-court settlement of a civil suit filed by the family, the boy involved was to receive a payment of more than $15 million. And then Snedden and his Los Angeles counterpart dropped the case when the boy and his family announced that they would no longer cooperate. Then after Paramount Pictures released the Adams Family film, Without Michael Jackson's song or accompanying short film, they still included him as a joke. <laughs> Michael's next album, History, which released in 1995, is to this day widely seen as his most personal album. As the majority of the new songs written for the record revolve around the allegations, Jackson's relationship with the media, and more, with a darker, more angry rock-inspired sound, perfectly exemplified by the lead single, Michael and his sister Janet's hit song, Scream, where for the first and only time in his career, Michael drops the F-bomb in his music while directly addressing the media. <laughs> Furthermore, for the first time, profanity shows up across a number of songs in the record, like the aggressive This Time Around, where Michael directly addresses more, the father of the accusing family in 1993, who Michael sound. claims was out to extort him. Somebody's got to accuse me, really want to accuse me, can falsely accuse me, this time around, I'm taking no sh Even Biggie has a feature. But the most interesting song is DS, the only diss track of Michael's career where he takes aim at Tom Snedden, the district attorney I mentioned earlier. And I have to say this track 
is cold. Michael straight up suggests that Stanton is part of the KKK and that his mom didn't raise him well, that he could be working for the CIA or FBI, and he even ends the song with a gunshot. Also, he couldn't have made it clear who the song is about because the chorus is literally... Anyways, now that you know all the necessary information and context, let's get into ghosts. In Mike Smallcomb's book, Making Michael, Inside the Career of Michael Jackson, Mike writes about how in light of the events of 1993, which stopped production of the original in the first place, finishing ghosts became even more important to Michael. And his record label was worried that the project didn't really serve any purpose, but couldn't stop Michael once he got it going. And when we look at it, it makes perfect sense why. Shauna Mongatol, one of the only cast members to return from Is This Scary, has spoken about the eerie way his life began to resemble the film. When those allegations came out, it was the most amazing um, example of art imitating life or life imitating art. <laughs> because everything that happened in Is This Scary at the same time started happening in his life. And the final version has some interesting changes, to say the least. While the original version of Ghosts has the mayor character played by the actor Ken Jenkins, one of the conditions that the new director made of Michael was for him to play all of the major parts, including the mayor. And so the mayor strongly resembles a certain district attorney by a name I can't exactly remember. I play that fat, grotesque, ridiculous mayor who, who, and I say it in that way because those kind of people, you know, who are just so stubborn, they just don't see the beauty of the inside of a person. A few things were shuffled around since the 1993 version of the film. For example, the original director, Stephen King frequent collaborator Mick Garris, who also co-wrote the story and screenplay, couldn't return because he had to work on the Shining miniseries. And so the head of makeup and special effects, Stan Winston, the special effects legend behind films like Jurassic Park, The Terminator, and The Thing, took over directing duties. And when the film opens, the angry mob approaches the maestro's house with their torches. The presentation of the film begins in black and white, which isn't the case in the original version, but maybe they just didn't add it since it technically wasn't finished. And when they enter the maestro's dilapidated mansion, the film changes to color. Now, I'm not gonna go all literature teacher on you, but I'm interpreting this as the same technique that was used in The Wizard of Oz. After Dorothy leaves Kansas, mm -hmm. it's literally bringing color and magic to the mundane. And the Spielberg-esque shots of the children looking in wonder throughout the film hammer this point home a little bit. You mean all this time, the only thing standing between hanging up there and living it up down here were those crows? Another interesting but kind of subtle change is that the young children featured in the film are changed from a mix of boys and girls in In This Scary to just boys and ghosts. Again, for the obvious real life parallel. Why don't we just leave him alone? He hasn't hurt anybody. Can't we just go? Your fault, Jerry. Just couldn't keep your mouth shut. He did the right thing. He's a weirdo. Show him the neat stuff he did for us. Shut up. That's supposed to be a secret. Some very subtle dialogue with a lot of subtext and nuance informs us of the situation at hand. You're weird. You're strange. And I don't like you. And then Michael's character, the maestro, makes a deal with the mayor. The first person to get scared has to leave. And so, he starts pulling some funny faces. Do you think this is scary? <laughs> That's it? Oh, God. That's ridiculous. Is this scary? When the mob tries to escape, Michael closes the doors. And then another interesting difference between ghosts and is this scary is Michael's performance after closing the door, with the original version being a lot more menacing and the final one a lot more friendly. No, you can't leave. You are my guest. <laughs> it's too late. You're my guest. Then after Michael says, meet the family, not the Adams family though, we launch into a dance routine where Michael rips off his skin 
almost as if he's opening himself to the closest possible examination, like he has nothing left to hide, and moonwalks as a CGI skeleton while the song is its scary plays, asking the media, the audience, and the mob the same question. An apt summary of the theme of the film. Afterwards, the skeleton, also played by Michael in a mocap suit, pulls the mayor onto the dance floor where he's trapped by the other ghouls, and then the skeleton transforms into the super ghoul. This is not my label, by the way. This is what the creature, also played by Michael, of course, is called in the credits. And it possesses the mayor to dance before he transforms into an ugly ghoul himself reflecting his own inner ugliness and, I guess, the ugliness of his values. Who's scary now? Who's the freak now? Freaky boy, freak circus freak, who's scary? After throwing up the ghost that possessed him and going back to normal, Michael agrees to go, something that the children absolutely don't want, and he dramatically turns into dust, his face dissolving slowly, symbolizing the tragic loss of his public image similar to a lyric he wrote on Stranger in Moscow from the History Album, where he laments his sudden fall from grace. In the first version of the film, the same thing happens, but in that version, the children rebuild Michael. Just pretend, was it? Just for fun? How come they don't know that? They do. Just forget. You're not scary at all. And then Michael disappears. After the mob leaves, they run into Wednesday, Pugsley, and other Adams Family characters, since this version was meant to tie in with the film. The final version's ending is a lot more definitive, though, with the fate of the mayor, because as the mob tries to leave, the super ghoul pulls one final prank on the mayor and appears as a giant head in the door after he opens it scaring him into jumping through one of the windows and vanishing. Then after revealing himself to be alive and simply an entertainer, the parents' initial fears of him being a danger are eased and seem to have been based on bias. And yeah, that dad over there is most deaf. That's pretty cool. Oh, damn. Then everyone has some fun scaring each other before cutting to a six minute long credit sequence that showcases Michael in the makeup chair preparing for his various different roles. Ghosts played at the prestigious Cannes Film Festival in France, by the way. Like, this short film was huge. And until 2013, with Pharrell Williams' 24-hour video for Happy, it held the Guinness World Record for the longest music video at 40 minutes long. Despite all this, and the fact that it went much bigger than Thriller did in every conceivable way, most people don't even know that this film exists or forgot how wild it is, especially in the unavoidably personal context that it exists in. If you're interested in how and why creators of films like this feature so many personal details of their lives and their work, check out my last video on self-insertion in fiction. A part two to that video will be coming very soon. And subscribe for more videos on all things entertainment. That was really good. And uh, I never knew that this movie existed um like like there's some there's been some weird michael jackson thriller uh, uh smooth criminal products over the year over the years um the video games the tie-ins things like that like you know but um this is this is cool and i wish it had come out like in the day like with the context these today like i'd probably still enjoy it because i liked moonwalker quite a bit moonwalker is one of my favorite movies of all time um and the visual effects in moonwalker were still impressive today so yeah i'd probably enjoy seeing this like uh, i'll be honest with you uh, let me know if um, this is all news to you as it was to me. Um, let me know your thoughts. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. And I love you all.
I'll see you guys in the next one.